Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's good to be with you. We are in one of those in-between seasons, aren't we? Christmas has come and gone. The new year is almost here, but not quite. And as we think about the new year, one of the things I often think about is, what am I going to be doing uh, with my quiet time in the morning, my time with God? And I've prepared a couple of reading plans for you, as we've done in the past. One is called the 555 New Testament Reading Plan. And you can pick this up back at the information desk on the table. This is reading one chapter a day, Monday through Friday, and you'll read through the entire New Testament in a year. The other one that we have is called the Chronological Bible Reading Plan. This one is a little bit more ambitious. You would read through the entire Bible. It's multiple chapters a day, but it doesn't just go through the books of the Bible in order. Uh, just as an example, uh, you're reading through Genesis 1 through 3 on the 1st of January, but by the 4th of January, you're into Job because that's what happens next chronologically, and it'll take you through the entire Bible. Now, I don't want you to avoid this one because you think, I don't have time to read multiple chapters a day. Don't get stuck on that. Just pick it up. Go ahead and read as you would normally. It doesn't matter if it takes you two years to do it. Nobody's grading you on that. Uh, I had somebody ask me this morning, and probably will have many more people ask me, how was your Christmas? I'll just be honest with you, it was challenging. Uh, it, it was some difficult things that happened that are still happening, but even in the midst of that all, it reminded me of what I want to read to you today from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surrounds or surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. My soul can anchor in that, and let's ask God to do that for us today. Heavenly Father, we know that this is a joyful time of year for many people. For others, it's challenging, and for others, it's sad. We pray that in the midst of all of that, we would never turn from you, that you are not just the God of happy times. You are our God through all things, and you walk through us through every circumstance, and you never leave us. You never forsake us. Father, this morning, we worship you because you are that God, the God who always is and who always will be. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and continue to worship our God.
Get up for her this morning. I will build.
midst of the darkest night of warping out for you The love of God is greater far than tell a thing could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star, and yet it reaches deeper still. The generations. Will pass away, and earthly kingdoms will fall. His boundless love shall never fade, and valley low on mountain tall. Amazing love. Amazing love.
we thank you for this amazing love that cannot be replaced, that cannot be hindered. Father, we thank you for the joy that is surrounded by Christmas. And even if we have gone through a, a trying season, a trying year, let alone, we thank you, Lord, that there is true joy found in you. There's true peace. Lord, would we live lives that reflect that? Father, we we give this, this time, this moment to you. And uh, Lord, would you work in our hearts and would you fill this place. Jesus, we love you. We praise you in your holy and wonderful name. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Hey, can we give a clap offering to the Lord, please? He, he is deserving of it. Uh, good morning, First Alliance Church family. My name is Pastor DeAndre and I have the privilege of being your youth pastor here at FAC. Um, if we've not had the opportunity to meet, let's change that. I'd love to be able to sit and say hello to you and your family and know how we can be praying for you. Uh, something else that I have the amazing privilege to be able to do is share in the study of God's Word with you. Uh, this is a very, very special time for me. Uh, it's always a really fun time because I love being able to share with you guys what I'm studying uh, and today we'll be looking at the book of Galatians together. We'll be reading Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Again, that's Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7. But before you do that, would you just pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, this time uh, that we have together, um, we know is a gift uh, that you've given us. Uh, we're grateful for it. Um, God, we offer this time uh, back to you um, for you to be able to do with it as you please. Holy Spirit, we, we welcome you here. We know that you are here. We know that you are moving. Um, and we're thankful, thankful that we get to be a part of that. Um, so God, anoint my words, uh, the study that I, uh, the time that I've spent, Lord, would you uh, just take that uh, and, and rest it on the hearts of those who are listening and those who are watching. 
Uh, we pray this in your holy name. Amen. How about that snow? Yeah? Anybody got any excuses for that? Or like, what is going on? Yeah, that's what everybody keeps telling me. <laughs> By a show of hands, um, how many of us have New Year's resolutions? Be brave. Raise your hands if you have New Year's resolutions. Come on, put them up there. There's nothing to be ashamed of. New Year's resolutions. Before landing in Galatian is our main text. I've, all, I've asked the question, what does one preach on this Sunday after Christmas? Pastor Scott was up here talking about this is a pretty awkward time, right, for us. The Christmas is done. New Year's hasn't happened yet, so we're in this very awkward spot. And my wife pointed out to me the other day, she said, ever since you started preaching, you somehow are always preaching this Sunday after Christmas. And I've, I've grown to love it. I've grown to like it. Uh, but the question is there, what, what does one preach on the Sunday after Christmas? When you come to church, what are you expecting to hear the Sunday after Christmas? Now, New Year's resolutions was definitely one of the themes that we could have preached on this morning. One of the themes that we could have talked about this morning. But don't worry, that's not what we're talking about. Because I don't keep New Year's resolutions. At all. I, I set them and then I rarely keep them. And it just doesn't work out for me. So I, I, I'm not going to stand up here and to preach to you about New Year's resolutions when I don't keep New Year's resolutions. But after some guidance and some prayer, I'm super excited that God has landed us in Galatians chapter 4. Because I feel like he's got something here for every single one of us that's sitting in this room. And every single person that is watching online. So let's read this together. It'll be Galatians chapter 4. Uh, verses 1 through 7. You can open up your Bibles there if you have them. Uh, the words will also be on the screen behind me, and if you're following along online, you'll be able to follow along as well. Um, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and I'll be reading from the ESV. Um, it says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. Friends, my goal this, this morning is simple. 2020 was an extremely rocky year. And we've got, what, four days left? I don't want to stand up here and, and, and preach to you uh, uh, and encourage you to write a new year, new me resolution. But what I feel the Lord calling me to do is to remind you that when 2021 gets Rocky, don't fall back into the same old habits that you did in 2020. Do not lose hope for the, for the challenges that 2021 may bring. Instead, focus on Christ and what he has done for you. And in order to make it through the rough patches that will come this new year, I want us to start off by understanding a few things. And I believe that we can learn those things by taking a close look at what Paul wrote and he was teaching this church in Galatia. So my goal this morning is that every single person listening and or watching this right now understands these two things. If you have a notebook, this is where you pull it out and you write it down. Simple. Thing number one, who you are without Christ. Who you are without Christ. Who you were without Christ. Understand that. Know that. And thing number two, who you are with Christ. Know that. Who you are with Christ. And I believe that if we understand these two things thoroughly, will give us the encouragement to look at 2021 and say, bring it on. Bring it on. Because I know for me, it feels like when 2020 showed up, it, it had its fun tormenting all of us. And now that this year is ending and this new year is beginning, I'm thinking to myself, what could this new year bring? Then I think to myself, oh, it could bring a lot. And then I get worried and then I start preparing I mean, this is what we do, right? Every year, 
Every year we do this. You know what? I didn't do this in 2020, but I promise in 2021, I, I'm, I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to be better at this thing. Or in 2020, I wasn't a very nice person. I didn't love my neighbor enough. I didn't go to church enough. I wasn't a good enough Christian. So you know what? In 2021, I'm going to do things differently. And here's what I'm going to do to do those things differently. Here's what I'm going to do to be a better Christian. And I feel like this is why God landed us in the book of Galatians today. If we're reading through that, our chapter begins about two-thirds into the letter that Paul is writing to this church. And I feel like when I open up the Bible and I begin to read through Paul's letters, he's usually writing to some churches who need encouragement or correction. And that's okay because 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is breathed out by God. That means inspired by God. That means he has placed it there. He wants it there. And it's good for profit. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training up in righteousness. So it's okay if we open up the Bible and we, we, we receive those things. So as we're reading through the book of Galatians, I feel like it's important for us to understand why Paul is writing to this particular church. Now, this church in Galatia was battling a series of false teachings that was causing the church to drift into particular practices. These false teachings were infiltrating the church by a select few of the Jewish population. And they were attempting to convince this Galatian church that if you want to move forward into becoming a better Christian... Here is what you have to do. It began to move this Galatian church away from their faith and into legalism. My favorite commentary writer says that this isn't too different from most Christians today. Or most churches for that matter. Right? We, we get involved in a, in a variety of legalistic movements hoping to become better Christians. Now the idea of becoming a better Christian isn't a bad thing, but I believe that Paul is saying this just isn't the way to do it. So your motives are good, but your methods, your methods are wrong. Paul is saying you don't need to do these things anymore because of who God is and what he has done for you. And because of who God is and what he has done for you, it has changed who you are. And this is why he starts in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything. These verses here is a continuation of what Paul is explaining in the few verses before. To paraphrase, Paul was referencing that there was a time that everyone was under the law. The law is equal to the Mosaic law or the law of Moses. And for the Gentiles, it was whatever pagan religion that they were following. Now, a few verses before our chapter starts, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 23, Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So I'm reading that, and I ask myself the question, what is is Paul talking about here? What is he talking about? When he says before faith came, he is talking about the establishment of the new covenant. This new covenant came by the death of Jesus Christ. This is what we remember and give thanks for when we take communion. This new covenant is what gives us the ability to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be saved from it. Before that was even an option, every single person was imprisoned to their sin. Every single person was held captive by their sin and they were enslaved to this old covenant. Now the old covenant was a conditional agreement that God made with the people of Israel. This old covenant required the Israelites to obey God and keep what's called the law. In return, God would protect the Israelites. He would provide for them. He would stop them from being overthrown. Now, the old covenant also required daily sacrificing of animals. This was a reminder of the people's sin, right? It was, it was a temporarily appeased the wrath of God, but it did not, could not, and never was intended to actually save the Israelites or anyone under the old covenant. Now, the Galatian church, they were familiar with the Old Covenant, and they were familiar with these practices. Paul then continues and says that the law, it acted as a guardian until Christ came. Once Christ came and died on the cross for our sins, this new covenant was established, and we no longer needed to be under the guardianship of the law. We no longer needed to sacrifice animals. We no longer needed someone else to go to God on our behalf like the high priest. Because once we were a part of this new covenant, we became one in Christ Jesus. 
He became our high priest. And if we are one with Christ, then we are heirs according to the promise of Abraham. This is what Paul's talking about. So Paul, he throws out this term, heirs. Then in chapter 4, verse 1, he explains what he's talking about. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Paul is using this illustration that a son, as long as he is a minor, as long as he is a small child, if his parents die, then he has the right to everything that his parents own. No one can take that away from him. That is his inheritance. However, while that child is still young and his parents are alive, he is in need of guardianship, which makes him no different from a slave. Now, it's my understanding that Paul is using this terminology because in the Roman world, the children of wealthy people were often cared for by servants. They were often cared for by slaves. No matter who the father was, the child was still a child. And that child was under the supervision of a servant. That servant was commanded by the master of the house, and that child was commanded by the servant. Paul was saying that the spiritual condition of anyone under the age of the law was the exact same way. The law was a guardian that disciplined the nation and prepared the people for the coming of Christ. Because that's what they needed. The Israelites needed to be babysat because they were God's chosen people. And he had a plan and a purpose for them so that until that time came, right? Until that time came, there needed to be a guardian over them. Now, it didn't change who they were to God. He still loved them. They were still his chosen people. It was just simply that this old covenant was their guardian and that it was absolutely necessary for it to be there. Paul then reminds them by saying that one day, the son would no longer need a guardian. He says in verse 2, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. This tells me that the guardianship wasn't just necessary, it was temporary. There is a time when a child grows up and becomes independent and then they are off on their own. Parents, I know that this is hard. I know some of you aren't, you can't wait for that day because I know some of your kids. <laughs> but it needs to happen. I mean, my oldest kid isn't even two years old yet, and it breaks my heart when I try and help her with something, something that I thought she couldn't do. And then she looks at me, she goes, no. That's her way of saying, I, I can do this. I got this now. And it feels like it was just yesterday that she could barely climb on the couch. And I guarantee you right now, she's probably at home running over to the TV, tapping it, going da-da. And then she's running back to the couch and she's climbing up there without any assistance. There will come a time when the father appoints a blessing or an inheritance over his child and that child will go. He says that the guardianship is no longer necessary, but this time is appointed by the father. It's never appointed by the child. And, and you see, this is, this is why the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son that Jesus tells is so mind-boggling to me. In Luke 15, Jesus tells this story. This is, it's a parable. It's a made-up made story. Jesus told this story of this father who had two sons. The younger son, who was more than likely just a teenager, asked his father for his share of his estate. Now, through some study that I did of this parable, the younger son asking for his share of his estate is, is perfectly legal. It's, it's his, right? The father is going to give it to him. When the father dies, it therefore belongs to his children. The son asking for this was perfectly legal. I mean, if this story that Jesus is telling was a real story, the younger son asking for what is rightfully his is legal, but it's extremely, extremely rude. And in fact, it would be like him saying, I can't wait for you to die before getting what's mine. I can't wait for you to decide that I'm ready for it. I don't care about anybody else. I just care about myself. I don't care about you. So just give me what is mine. It, it was rude because the boy wouldn't have gotten his share of the estate until his father died or even before his older brother got what was his. But he walked up to his dad and said, give me what is mine. And that is exactly what the father did. Jesus says he, he gave it to him. The younger brother went off with his share of his estate, his inheritance, with no guardianship, no rules, no one there to control his actions, 
And he decided to spend it all on really, really, really awful things. Now, for the Israelites, they had guardians. They had a guardian. They had the commandments brought down by Moses. They had the law. They had the old covenant. They had elementary principles that were there to guard them and their behavior. But it was never designed to permanently save them. And until the day that God, their father, would decide that the guardianship was no longer necessary, they would be forever enslaved to the old covenant. Now, this is where Paul starts to swing things around. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 3, he says, In the same way, we also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. I think it's cool what he did here. He used elementary principles because the audience that Paul is writing to, he is saying that these elementary principles are like the foundation of what they know. It goes back to their basics. Commentary writer Warren Wiersbe says it's like their spiritual ABCs. He's talking about the things that were extremely necessary for them to have learned and to know so they would be ready for when Christ came. Learning these things are extremely important. It's important that a person learns his or her ABCs, right? It's the foundation of knowing how to read and eventually learning how to study. It's the reason that my wife is teaching our children our ABC, their ABCs right now. But there's an expectation that there will be a development. I mean, I know my ABCs. Maybe not without singing the melody in my head first. But imagine when I was in college... And I'd go to the library, and I'd sit down, and I'd study. And I'd sit at that table with no textbooks, and I'd go, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, F. And I never picked up a textbook, and I never studied. I would never pass any midterms or any finals. Because the, my ABCs are important to know because they're the foundation of learning how to read and to study. But if I don't pick up a textbook, if there's not development there, it's useless. This is why, right, this is, and it's important, this is why the Old Testament is extremely important to read and to know, because it's a great reminder of the condition of the world without Christ. Paul is his, reminding his readers, this is who we are without Christ. There was a time when we were children, and we were under guardianship, we were enslaved to sin, and before Christ, we were stuck. We had no hope. We were in desperate need of saving, and we could not save ourselves. God had given judges at a time. He had given us the law. He had even flooded the earth once, and he even opened up the ground and swallowed up hundreds of people. He did all of those things, but none of that was to save us. It was all just to regulate our behavior. But God had a plan. He had a plan to save us, and there needed to be something to guide us until we got to that point. Because we kept messing up and doing things that would hurt us, he needed to give us this guardianship. It was necessary. And this is true for us today. I remember in Sunday school learning the Ten Commandments, asking, why is this necessary to know? I'm not going to do any of these things. Growing up, my parents had these rules that I needed to follow. And even though I thought some of those rules were extremely unfair... Now, I, as a parent, I have rules that my children need to follow. And at times, I'm sure Izzy and Xander are going to look at me and be like, this dude is crazy. These rules are so unfair. But they're just temporary. The reason that they are there is to regulate the behavior of my children and to keep them safe. In hopes that they will grow up and hold on to those principles that my wife and I have taught them. But when they move away, they don't need to follow our rules. Even though we are teaching them those rules, when they grow up, it, it will not be the rules that stop them from making the decisions that they're going to make. Just as the Old Testament law, the elementary principles that Paul is talking about, will, cannot, and were never designed to save anybody. Which is why when they were under the Old Covenant, they were enslaved to their sin. Because the law was never intended to save anyone. Only Christ was. And it's the same for us today. If you are without Christ, you are enslaved to your sin. The finished work that Christ has done on the cross provided us the New Testament. 
If you do not have Christ, it does not apply to you. You are in bondage. There is a debt that is on your life that you can never repay. You will work your entire life for it until the day that you die. And once that day comes, without Christ, none of it matters. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin equals death. See, without Christ, you are lost. You will go into 2021 with, with all that it has to bring. You will feel alone. You will struggle alone. And on your time on this earth ends, when that happens, and you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will do so fully enslaved to your sin. My mom used to say there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it until we get to verse 4. Paul illustrates here, he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Paul says we were all in bondage. We were all enslaved to our sin under guardianship for a regulation of our behavior. But God had a plan. We talked about this plan during Christmas Eve. We celebrated the coming of this plan on Christmas Day. That plan was that God would send us his son Jesus to be born here on this earth in order to redeem those who were under the law. This was a plan that was originated from the beginning. If we read Genesis 3.15, it says that between the offsprings of you and this woman, her offspring will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. From that moment, God's plan to redeem those who were under the law was set in motion. Which again is why Paul is making an emphasis that there was a time when we were all in bondage, all under guardianship until the date set by the Father. That was God's plan. And Paul is saying in order for this plan to work, Jesus needed to be born of a woman. He needed to be born under the law that he, that, that he was there to redeem us from. Jesus needed to be fully man and fully God for this to work. God promised that victory would come from the offspring of that woman. Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Which is why he said, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. I am the fulfillment of these things. In other words, the reason that I have come is so that you no longer have to be enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. You no longer have to be enslaved by the elementary principles of this law. You are in bondage, enslaved to your sin, and currently under guardianship until the thing that actually can save you comes. And Jesus says, that is me. Paul says again in verses 4 and 5, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive something. You are going to receive something. Something that is going to change who you are. It's going to change your identity. And that something that you are going to receive is adoption as sons. This is the purpose. This is who you are with Christ. You are a son, you are a daughter, you are adopted into his royal family. This is what the new covenant offers you. Adoption as sons. And why is this necessary? Because one of my favorite sayings, something that I love to remind myself is that the son has a father while the servant just has a master. My dogs, Cassie and Nico, even though they have like actual people names, uh, it was really funny. My college roommate thought I named my dog after him because my college roommate's name was Nico and, and our dog's name was Nico. So he thought we named our dog after him. And he was like, dude, come on. I was like, no, it's just the only name he responds to. My dogs, Cassie and Nico, I am their master. They are given commands, and there is an expectation that those commands are followed. When I say come, I'm expecting my dogs to come. When I say go outside and go to the bathroom, I'm expecting my dogs to go outside and go to the bathroom and not on my carpet. Unless it's raining, then my pit bull Cassie does not go outside. If it's not sunshine, she doesn't want to be outside. This snow, she doesn't like it. When someone comes to my house, my dogs are trained to let me know that people are coming to my house, so they bark. And if I'm not there to give them a command to stop barking or my wife gives them a command to stop barking, they're going to continue to bark. But when we tell them to stop barking, they are to stop barking because that 
is what they were commanded to do. There was a time where I called uh, Cassie, my daughter, and I called Nico, my son, but I had to stop doing that because now I actually have a son and a daughter, and there's a lot of confusion when it comes to that. When you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God rose Jesus from the dead, when when he died on the cross to save you from the bondage of your sin, the book of Romans tells that the Holy Spirit confirms inside of you who you really are. And that is a child of the Father. Paul continues to remind us of who we are with Christ. He says in verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Abba. Father. Abba, Father. That word Abba that is used there is an Aramaic word for Papa. There is a difference in tone in the word Dada when my kid needs something from me and then when my kid needs me. When her eyes are swelling with tears and she's pink in the cheeks and the floodgates of snot is wide open and she yells Dada. There is absolutely nothing that will stop me from getting to my kid. But when she goes over to the food pantry and pulls out the cookies and looks at me and goes, Dada, and she signs more, please. No, she wants something from me. There is a difference in tone there. When you are in the bondage of your sin, you are obeying things out of the elementary principles that you know. No matter who taught them to you, it's just what you know. But when you have received Christ, you are obeying out of love. Because the Spirit is working in our hearts consistently. The law does not produce obedience. That's why people keep breaking the law. Only love can. Which is why Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Paul continues for a few more verses, but our time is going to end in verse 7. He says here in verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then he continues, he says, "So, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. See, earlier I shared the story of this parable that Jesus told in in Luke 15. The story began with his son taking his share of the inheritance. And he he goes out and he spends it on a bunch of things he shouldn't have spent it on. And then while he's absolutely poor, he's working one of the lowest jobs you could possibly work. And he's hungry and he can't eat the food that he needs to feed to the animals. So he says, I got this bright idea. I'll go back to my father and I'll tell my father to make me like one of his servants, one of his hired men, one of his slaves. Because, man, they're eating better than I am, and I'm hungry. So he comes up with this master plan, and Jesus says that he goes back to the Father. And Jesus says that out of compassion, out of compassion, when the Father sees the Son, he gets up and he runs to the Son. He embraces the Son, and the Son tells what he rehearsed in his head. Father, I have sinned against you, and I have sinned against heaven. Make me like one of your hired men. And then the Father goes, no. Take the fattened calf that we have, the the biggest one, and kill it. We're going to have a feast. Get a clean robe and put it on my son. Get sandals and put it on his feet. Because we're going to celebrate the fact that once you were lost, when you were gone, you were lost. You were dead. And now that you're home, you are alive. You are found. And then it says that the father put a ring on the, 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 the son's finger. Reminding him that you are not a slave. You are my son. That is your identity. You do not have to be a slave. You do not have to be a servant. You are my son. This is who we are with Christ. We may have run off. We may have denied for a very long time. We may be still following some elementary principles that we think can save us. During that time, we are in bondage. We are trapped in our sin, living under the old covenant. If you are a non-believer, this is you. Chains everywhere. You're locked down. There's no hope. You cannot free yourself. If you are a believer and you have accepted Jesus, you've been freed from that, but you keep bending down and picking the chains up. Stop doing those things. God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross to be a payment that would set you free because the wages of sin is death. So Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice paid the price for your freedom with his life. 
You accepting that means that you become a son of God and therefore an heir, which means that you are entitled to everything that the Father offers. This is who you are with Christ. Again, without Christ, you are lost, you are dead and forever enslaved to your sin. This is not a metaphor. This is truth. You are attempting to work off a debt that you will never repay. But with Christ, that debt is paid in full. Those chains are gone. You've been set free. And when you need him the most, your heart cries out, Papa, Abba, Father. And he is there. And there's so much more than just that. Paul continues with his letter to remind his Galatian brothers and sisters that it's, it's important to, to remember those elementary principles. But you don't need to do those things anymore because Christ has come and he has saved you and he has set you free. And that changes who you are. So what were you expecting to hear the Sunday after Christmas? I pray that it's today you are remembering who you are without Christ. If you are a believer, who you were without him, who you could be without him. If you are an unbeliever, who you are now. But I also pray that you know who you are with Christ. Who you could be with him. And if you have not accepted the Lord as Savior, would today be the day that you do that? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead. If you've done this already with this new year coming... Remember, it doesn't really matter what 2021 brings. Because I know who I am. I know who my father is. You are sons and daughters who are one with Christ Jesus. Which means that you are promised some things. We are promised that when we are weary and burdened, he will give us rest. He promises that with man... The way man does things, maybe elementary principles of this world, things are impossible with, with God. All things are possible. Scripture says that whatever we ask for in prayer, we should believe that we will receive it. And friends, that's just why we're here on earth. We get heaven. We get heaven when we die. All that we're experiencing on this earth right now is like just one mighty fine donut. Just one. But when we get to heaven, it's like we own the whole bakery and we could just go there and just eat all the donuts. There's so much more, so much more. No more pain, no more tears, no more DMVs, no more COVID, no more masks. Who said amen? You're wrong. You know you're wrong. It's like he said it. When 2021 gets rocky, stand firm, look it straight in the face, and you say, bring it on. Because I know who I am. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you sent us Jesus to free us from our sin. But you didn't stop there. You said that you love us so much that you'd give your one and only son that whoever should believe in him, we would not perish, but we would have everlasting life, life as sons and daughters, Life is heirs, life abundantly. You welcomed us when we were broken and lost and enslaved to our sin and bondage. You came to us, you loved us, and you saved us. We are thankful for that. So in this year that, that approaches in a handful of hours, Lord, may we remember who we are. We remember who you are and what you've done for us. We pray this in your holy, holy name. Amen.
Would you stand and worship with us? I just, as your benediction, I, I, want, to, I want to continue to read um, what Paul says in his letter after the seven verses that, that we had. He says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world who slaves you want to be, who, who, who wants you to, to be enslaved once more? So, so your benediction to today is to, to make a decision to no longer be enslaved. If you are a believer, walk in the freedom without those chains. If you are not a believer, my encouragement to you is do not leave this place in chains. Go and know that you are loved more than you can ever imagine. Be warm, guys. Thanks for coming.